And Singapore will be coming up with better ways to care for the trees in Southeast Asian cities. The National Parks Board and the Landscape Industry Association Singapore will develop the first code of practice for pruning tropical trees in urban environments. Existing guidelines for tree management may be inadequate as they are based on practices in temperate regions. It is hoped that the new guidelines will make the trees less susceptible to pests and diseases, thereby improving their long-term health. And Parks and LIAS will be setting up a work group to canvas opinions from stakeholders and a first draft of the code is expected to be published mid-2026. Having a set of national standards uh, built through consensus and drawing from the expertise of industry practitioners ensure a higher level of care for the tree and this is to prevent uh, incorrect pruning practices that can result in pest, disease, decay and eventually potential failure. This code of practice will be helpful. It will provide tree owners, tree care practitioners amongst you and training providers with clear guidelines and service standards related to tree pruning. We are also looking at, actively looking at standards in other areas of tree management, and that includes tree inspection and tree maintenance. And for more analysis on these national standards, we're now joined by Professor Vera Sikaran from the NUS Office of President. He is also Professor at the Department of Biological Sciences at the NUS College of Design and Engineering. We are also joined by Dr. Sean Lam, Senior Lecturer at the NTU Asian School of the Environment, and he is also Immediate Past President of Nature Society Singapore. Gentlemen, welcome to Singapore tonight. Thanks Thank for joining us. Uh, Professor Vera, let's start with you. What are the current and industry best practices when it comes to tree care and management and why the need for nationwide standards at this point? So when we started the road towards managing and maintaining our trees in our urban environment, we had depended on the International Society of Arboriculture that we came across that will actually help us set some certification and standard practices. Those practices came from the temperate region, mostly from America and Europe as well. Uh, subsequently, we learned along the way that many of the practices and techniques were useful for us mm -hmm. uh, with tree cutting and tree climbing, etc. These were very useful techniques. But many of these techniques were not necessarily for tropical trees as such. Because many of the tropical trees behave very differently with uh, uh, supposed to temperate trees as well. Um, if you look at many of our trees that are actually planted on strode sites now, many of them are ornamental in nature as well. Some would be practical for us to apply, deploy some of those standards that came from the temperate region. Mm. But increasingly, our vegetation is changing. Vegetation types are changing. We're going towards a lot more nat native trees. And I think the standard needs to be relooked as well. And obviously, the practices that we've had for the last 20, 30 years has to be then relooked as well because those trees are changing. Our methods, are, our methods of managing and maintaining the trees has to change as well. Mm. I think this is a good direction and I think NPAX is trying to reach out to the industry to try and canvas ideas and look at what are the practices that are more suitable for our tropical trees. And over the years, we've seen a few cases of trees uh, toppling down and causing death, injury and even destruction to property. Uh, Dr. Lam, let's bring you in here. How far will these guidelines go in preventing or rather helping to reduce such occurrences? You know, thanks, Shahid. A very interesting, pertinent question. I mean, to, to be fair, we, we've been remarkably successful over the past 20 years. I think in 2001, over 3,000 cases of tree failure of some sort. We've got that number down to about 400 per year. So we've already made quite a bit of progress. But I think these new standards will allow us to kind of work with the trees, not just kind of cutting them back, but, mm. but actually understanding how they grow and then pruning them, managing them in a way that we just kind of head off all of these problems long before they start. And it's also something like understanding how they grow, what they need. So even before you plant the tree, you've got the right tree in the right place for those conditions. And then, then the tree management then comes in to sort of clean up the rest. Right. Okay, in your view, what are the key warning signs of a potentially hazardous tree um, that often go unnoticed? 
we should let the tree whisper. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be Buddha. <laughs> well, I mean, so so if you if you look at traditional arboriculture, those guys are wizards. They really can recognize when yeah. trees are stressed, how how there might be signs of rot that you, maybe to you and I would yeah. be invisible. Mm. They can sense a little bit of tilt or the way the tree is growing. But there are lots of things that you cannot see, and and that's the thing. So you you want to have the technology to maybe yes. detect things early, but at the same time manage the trees so that they don't get the fungal infection and all these other things in the first place. And I think that's where all of these new standards will come in very useful. Mm, and Professor Vera, um, looking ahead to the actual content of these guidelines, what are some features and practices um, you think the new guidelines must have, as well as problems it must address? I think it's a lot to do with now looking at technology coming into the, into the area, so into this area. Mm. Uh, technology is playing a big part in how we manage the trees now within our spaces, within the built environment. Uh, I know for a fact that NPARCS has got GIS systems that actually has got enough information about almost all the trees that are there planted in Singapore. But it's also important that not only NPARCS manages the trees, the other agencies are also involved like SLA, HDB, mm -hmm. Jurong Town Count, JTC and all the other agencies that actually have got land owners, they also manage trees as well. Right? And, and basically trying to make sure that all of them are coming on board so that the standards are across the board for all the agencies to do. And I think this, this particular standard is trying to do that okay. so that all the other agencies are also on board. And there's one standard that's cut across all, the whole of Singapore mm. so that no one says one or the other. But that said, it's also a lot to do with how we develop the technologies. Right? So it's good to, con to actually then work with the, the universities and the other, the other IHLs come up with various methods of actually then detecting, for example, decay mm. or even tilts that happens on trees because when the trees are in danger and the ground moves, the trees can tilt. But the trees can tilt up to a point where there will be a point of no return. And those are danger signs, right? Then how do you then activate some of these uh, sensors that actually give you enough information about ground movement, the, the angle of the tree tilting, that can give you data. And those data is quite useful for you to then mitigate some of these possible hazards that can happen going forward. Okay. And these standards, they are geared towards urban trees, right? But what about our natural landscapes? Is there scope for the natural uh, national standards rather to extend to the way we manage our forests as well? Yes, yeah, certainly. I mean you want to call them standards or some sort of management strategy. Mm -hmm. our, our forests, you know, if you go to say Macritchie Reservoir, you can still see these original patches of forest that are 200, 300 years old that were somehow left standing. They, they're quite resilient, but they're not very quick at taking over the landscape. So what we really need to do is to shore up the rest of the forest, kind of try to restore them to some of that something that's closer to the original state, buffer them better, and then let them do their thing because they're going to adapt it yeah. to it. But then we really need to create the conditions and and uh, connecting these populations up so that they have every chance of surviving. Can we apply the same standards or guidelines to forests? To a certain extent, yes. I mean, I, I think uh, trees in forests grow very differently than when they're in the open. open. Mm -hmm. So they, they have ways of adapting to those conditions. But where, where there's sometimes going to be trouble is at the forest edge, where these trees experience conditions that are actually a little bit a little bit drier, a little bit windier, and that's where you might need to protect that forest edge a little bit. Where do you think would be the challenges in applying national standards to uh, natural forests, Dr. Vera? Well, if, if you, so the vegetation types that we're actually now looking at in terms of uh, tropical uh, forests, mm. uh, or if not even within the built environment, we are increasingly having a lot of native species that we're trying to use within the spaces that we have. We're moving away from all the ornamental trees. I think that's very good for us because we're trying to bring in a lot of the native trees. Increasingly, the landscape is designs also changing. Mm -hmm. We are looking at a lot more regenerative, regenerative tropical microforest systems that are scapes that actually will come into play as well. There are a lot more uh, tropical forest scapes that actually then you plant trees very differently from a current ornamental landscapes that you would have. Okay. So I think when we do when we do scapes of this type then you need to have different standards as you need to evolve as well. And I think this, is, this is starts a very good roadmap for us as we change our designs into city and nature. 
then that becomes a lot more relevant as we then develop as a nation of all the greenery that we have coming mm. through. There will come a time when ornamental trees might not survive the conditions that we're going to have with climate change as well. Right? I think these are dangers that mm. we need to be aware of. And then we change the tree species as we go along. Obviously, that those trees will last for a longer period with us. So you talk about the need to evolve with climate change bringing more erratic mm -hmm. um, extreme weather resilience is becoming key isn't it so how can we weather proof our trees against unpredictable weather conditions uh, in the years to come so i think it's the planting schemes that you would have deployed uh, if you look at the road sites now the planting schemes are very different from what they were 20 years ago you can look at the vegetation types right and i think this is beginning to be what we are looking at as normal now and i think those are very important and i think this is also important for the industry and the clients who actually then appreciate these kinds of vegetation to also come on board. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a lot to do with the education that goes with it. Right. And, 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 you know, a tree we plant today might still be around when our grandchildren are around. So I think to anticipate it to some extent how this climate, our rainfall patterns will change, yeah. temperatures will change. And so picking the right trees now to kind of future proof yeah. our streetscapes, yeah. urban forests, and to understand that they're living things. They, yes. they have personalities, they're beautiful. They're so we have to green our hearts too. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. a very good way to put it. I mean, looking at trees in a different way now. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining us tonight. Uh, that was Professor Vera Sikaran from the NUS College of Design and Engineering, and Dr. Sean Lam from the NTU Asian School of the Environment. Thank you.